Thank you, Carlisle. Good morning. Great to have you here. Today we are going to talk about the subject, controlling people in our lives. As my son Caleb, who turns 22 this week, I can't believe it, uh, was growing up, we got to the point in our relationship where we could bond significantly while playing video games. So we got our first game console. We loved it. We would play games. And I loved it because I could cream him. I mean, I didn't hold back. I destroyed him in any game that I could. I loved it. Uh, but very shortly, he started to overtake me. He was, he was getting better, faster. He could do things with the controller that I was unable to think fast enough to do, and this became very apparent in one of our favorite games to play. It was a special ops game called Splinter Cell. I don't know if you've ever played it, uh, but it was a, a fun one for us. We enjoyed uh, doing that together, and he just got so much better at it than, than I did that I needed some cheat codes to help me keep up with him. If you don't know what a cheat code is, uh, game designers program into games uh, different kind of cheat codes that that people can use to help them get unlimited life, help them recover faster, help them get special weapons, whatever it is, up, down, up, down, back, forth, back, forth, A, B, A, B, 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 A, and then bam, you have these special cheat codes that were built in. In our lives, there are pitfalls that we're going to run into, there are obstacles that we're going to face, there are challenges that we're going to need to overcome that are going to require some cheat codes for us. And thankfully, God has given us those. One of the most challenging things that we're going to face in our lives relationally is controlling people. Thankfully, God has given us some cheat codes to help us win. And we're going to look at how Jesus used a few of them in John chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and grab that thing out and begin to turn to John chapter 6. Uh, you find the New Testament. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is the fourth book. Um, in the New Testament, and we're going to start in verse 5. We're going to read through verse 15, and we're going to read a situation that you're probably familiar with, where Jesus feeds the 5,000, and then we're going to look at how Jesus responded to some people that wanted to try to control him because of the work that he did uh, in this miracle. So here we go, starting in verse 5. Words on the screen so you can follow along. When Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming towards him, and he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread to have, for everyone just to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will this go among so many? And Jesus said, hey, have all the people sit down. Uh, there was plenty of grass in that place, and so they, they sat down. There were about 5,000 men, plus the women there and children. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Holy mackerel. <laughs> That's not in your Bible? That's in my Bible. <laughs> Must be the preacher version. When they had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over. Or there were five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Surely this is the one. This is the guy. I mean, who else could do something like this? Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Let me pray. Let me pray. God, thank you um, for your love and your grace and your mercy for us. And God, I just pray that you would help us to uh, know you fully, to know, um, as Carlisle was saying, not, not only to know you intellectually, but to know how much you love us and how much you care for us and uh, God, I just pray that you would help us here th this morning to understand a, a little bit more about the people that are around us, the people that um, can have controlling tendencies and that want to try to control our lives. And God, give us the cheat codes that we need uh, to interact with them well, uh, to honor you in our interaction with them, and uh, God, to be useful to you in their lives, um, if you so think that's uh, something we should do. Please, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So I'm going to go through three cheat codes here and just kind of give them to you. We can talk a little bit about them, um, and, and then we'll get to some application uh, towards the end. So if you have something to write with, go ahead and grab that now. You can write on the back of your notes or in the side of your margin, your Bible, or whatever it is. So here's cheat code number one. Uh, if you're going to deal with people who are controlling, uh, trying to control you, you have to find your center. You have to find your center. When I first heard the story of Jesus, it was through a friend that handed me a little booklet. I was 18 years old, and uh, one of my friends, uh, Mark Babb, gave me this little yellow booklet. This would have been the early 90s, and, and this booklet was called The Four Spiritual Laws. Has anybody ever heard of The Four Spiritual Laws? Raise your hands. A little yellow book. Yeah, the tracks were a big deal back then, and people handed those out. And I got that, and I remember opening it up, and the very first law was God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. There's also another little booklet that a lot of people don't know exists, but it's called The Four Controlling Laws, and it was written by some control freaks. And law number one is God loves you, and I have a wonderful plan for your life, right? Multiple times in Jesus' ministry, he was offered a, a new plan for his life by other individuals. A quick survey of the gospel will reveal this to be true, not just in the text we looked at today. Religious leaders who always had a plan for Jesus' life. We know that the disciples, specifically Peter, had a plan for Jesus' life. And multiple times, the crowd tried to move up Jesus' timeline and try to get him to do something that he was not ready to do. Jesus never wavered. He knew what he was, he knew who he was, and he knew what God had called him to do. He was centered. He was God's son sent to be the savior of the world. This had to help him ward off any controlling influences that people were trying to put upon him. Two of the most powerful questions that you will ever answer in your life are these two. Who has God created me to be and who is he calling me to become? Who did God create me to be and what is he doing in my life and who, what is he trying to transform me into? If you have a solid answer to these questions and you have the discipline and the stubbornness as Joshua talked about last week to live out of this center in your life, you will find great success in warding off the influences of controlling people. Do you have an answer to those questions? Do you know who you are? Do you know what God has created you to do, where God, where God is taking you, what he is trying to make out of you, how he is trying to transform you? You need to get a grasp on those things to be centered in your life so that you will not be susceptible to being controlled by other people. Cheat code number two, identify or be able to identify controlling people. You got to be able to spot them. Jesus could. Some controlling people are easy to identify. They stand out like a sore thumb. Others, not so much. They're a little harder to see. Uh, maybe we don't want to see certain people as controlling because we either want something from them or, or we care about them so much, we just don't want to see it. Uh, maybe we're looking to be popular or approval, and we don't care if controlling people are trying to control us as long as they like us, you know, it makes us more popular. Or maybe they're just really good and they perfected their controlling craft and we just can't see how they are controlling our lives all that easy. Whatever the case is, Jesus was really good at spotting them. Notice what the text says here. Knowing they intended to come and make him king by force. He knew this. He could see it. And so he responds appropriately because of this. Are you good at spotting controlling people? I have a friend, his name is Andy, who is really, really good at spotting, controlling people. And I've learned a lot over my friendship, my 20-plus year plus year friendship with him on how to spot controlling influences in my life. And I think he's really good at it, and I've seen this to be true as I've interacted with people through ministry, that uh, he's really good at it because in his growing up years, his formative years, he had a lot of controlling people around him. And when he was a teenager and on into college, he learned that they were really not healthy relationships, and so he had to break free of those. And I think because he's used to the smell of controlling people that he can just smell them before other people can. 
He's really good. How about you? Are you good at spotting, controlling people? I sat down and began to make the, the a list of the types of people that are controlling, and here are the ABCs of controlling people. Maybe this will help you identify controlling people in your life. Turn your attention to the screen. There are the aggressor. There's the aggressor, some bully physically, emotionally, or verbally. We can all think of these people. By the way, that'd be a great wrestler name, the aggressor. <laughs> There's the blamer. The person's always blaming. It's your fault. There's the critic always pointing out what you've done wrong. There's the dominator. Now, there's another good wrestling name right there, the dominator. Everything that you are doing is a challenge to their authority, right? The dominator. The exploiter. The fear mongerer, intimidating you through fear. The guilt tripper, using guilt like a pro. The hostage taker, keeping you held hostage by your failures. The isolator, I've seen this one a lot, keeping you away from people or trying to keep you away from people all to themselves. The jealous jerk. <clears throat> if you aren't with them 24-7, something's wrong with you. The know-it-all. The liar. The manipulator. Manipulates everything to their own good. The needy sucker. You know any needy suckers? They love their problems. And you just have to hear about them again. The oppressor, they hold you down unjustly, keep you in your place. The pressurer, I know that's not a word, but I made it up for this one. The pressurer, they use pressure, peer pressure, or some other type of pressure to get you to do what they want. Uh, the quality police, it's never good enough for them. Whatever you're doing, it's never good enough. And if you would just listen to them, you would be better. I think this is the one that Jesus is dealing with here. Oh, Jesus, we've got this great idea about how you could be on top of the world. Let us help you get there. There's the reducer. They degrade or belittle you. There's the Stalin, just a dictator, just bosses you around. The talent scout. You could be great if you just listen to this person or do what they say. The urgency, emergency, everything is always, we have a crisis, do this now. You must know those people. There's the victim, often not seen as a controlling person, but they are. You're constantly asked to save them. Uh, there's always something that happened to them, and, and they're using that victim mentality to try to control you. There's the whiner. They're always whining, get what they want. You're wondering what I have for X, aren't you? You're wondering. There's the xenophobic, un-American, anti-whatever labeler. <laughs> I remember here in the last year having a look up what a xenophobe was, because I had never heard that word before, the last political cycle. And it seems like everybody was throwing that around or on the other side, you're un-American, get your hands off my guns. You know, I mean, there was like this, everybody puts labels, everyone's trying to put labels on everyone and you didn't want to be that label so you're being controlled to come to their side and that was really annoying, the labeler. There's the you owe me one, always trading in favors to try to control you. And then this one is pretty common in church. The religious zealot, the person who's got their zeal for God and they're using it to try to get their way. You shouldn't do this because good Christians don't play cards. They just don't. And they don't want you to play cards, even though there's nothing in the scripture about playing cards. They don't want you to play cards. So they make it a religious issue when it's really not one at all. Did anyone come to mind as I was reading through the list? Did anybody have anybody come to mind? Raise your hand if you had somebody come to mind, maybe a few people. Some people just don't know any controllers, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I had a few people come to mind, and when I made my list, I was horrified to discover one person kept coming up on multiple <coughs> occasions, and that person was me. It's easier to spot controlling tendencies of others before you ever spot them in yourself. But I can't help but think of Jesus' words here. First, remove the plank out of your own eye before you try to remove the 
speck out of somebody else's. It would be valuable to us and to the people that we love if we would look at ourselves first and our controlling tendencies and that we would use cheat code number two on us, that we would look and identify in our own lives where we can tend to be controlling. I had a friend here recently who found mold under their kitchen cabinets. It was caused by a small leak that they had no idea was there. Uh, it was small enough that it, that it wasn't causing a major flood, but it was big enough that it was allowing mold to grow underneath their entire kitchen cabinets. And they were horrified about this. They had to rip them out. They had to get you know, the mold treated. They had to redo their kitchen. It wasn't in their budget. They weren't expecting it. It was a big pain in their rear end. It was not good news. However, they were grateful they could address the situation before it harmed their children or themselves. So too, it's going to be uncomfortable to look at yourself and realize that you, have, you can identify controlling tendencies in your own life, but if you can get a handle on them, if you begin to address them, it'll not only help your health, but it'll bless the people that are around you. Cheat code number three. You got to learn to manage the relationships that you have. You got to learn to manage your relationships. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus had multiple opportunities to interact with people who had great plans for his life. He had multiple opportunities. And he didn't respond to each of them in the exact same manner. He was direct with some, specifically the religious people who should have known better. He was pretty bold and direct and spoke to them directly in front of others. He was frank and blunt with others in a smaller crowd setting. For example, when Peter was trying to control him, he turned his back to him and said, get behind me, Satan. And I could imagine the other disciples were like, oh, no, he did it. <laughs> and on a few occasions, like the one we have here, he said nothing at all. He just walked away. He just walked away. As you manage your relationships, there are going to be times when you have to just simply walk away. Sometimes you have to step away from the relationship for a period of time, give it some space so that that relationship can be repaired or move forward or it might be a relationship that can never get back together again. It might just be too unhealthy. We see Jesus doing that here with the crowd. There are some relationships that are just not heading in the right direction, and you're going to need to hit the eject button and just get out of them. You can't fly like an eagle if you hang out with turkeys. <laughs> this week, I did something I rarely do. As a matter of fact, I can't remember the last time that I did this. I unfriended somebody on Facebook. <gasps> so if you check your Facebook status, friendship with me right now, you might realize it's you that I'm about ready to talk about <laughs> from, the, <laughs> from the stage. Awkward. I won't go into great details, uh, but this individual consistently posts stuff that I'm like, he's trying to manipulate things, and I'm like, give me a break. Uh, you got to... You're like in your 50s, but you're acting like you're in your teens. Let's get over this. Let's mature. So gave him the benefit of the doubt, call him on it gently um, there underneath one of his posts. And uh, uh, he replied basically laughing at me. And um, so I said, peace out, homie. I am not going to be, uh, I'm not going to do this anymore, you know, with you. I'm not, I'm just not interested in that type of a deal. However, Real life is not social media. You know that, right? Please tell me you know this, that you understand this. Social media is not real life. Social media is people's highlight reel, right? It's their, it's their best of series, and then real life is something quite different, right? It's your behind the scenes. What's easy to accomplish on social media, I'm just going to unfriend somebody, is not as easy when you're having to look the controlling person 
in their eye. And when you know that person in an intimate way. And you can't unfriend every person who exhibits controlling patterns in their lives. You would have very few friends, and chances are nobody would be friends with you if they followed suit. Additionally, it's a little unrealistic and possibly ungodly for us to think that we can remove all controlling people from our circles. I mean, after all, some people, these controlling people, you're related to. Like, you can't get away from them, right? You're related to them. Some people you work for are controlling individuals, and you like the job, and you, you want to stay at the job, and why is my staff now laughing at me over here? I, I'm a little nervous. I can see them out of the corner of my eye laughing when I said that. You work for them. Some you've been friends with for a long time. And you love them. You can't just ima- you just can't drop them from your life. You can't walk away from everybody. And what if? What if instead of walking away, God wants to use you from a place of strength to help them move forward? What do you do then? Well, in managing your relationships, you have to stand your ground. You have to learn to stand your ground. No matter what's going on around you, you have to stand your ground. And if you're centered, as we talked about earlier in cheat code number one, if you're centered, this is going to help you stand your ground. I'm not saying that when you stand your ground, if you're centered, it's not going to get your blood pressure up. And it's it's not that being centered takes away that pit in your stomach when you have to make a stand. I mean, it's going to be uncomfortable when you do it no matter how centered you are. But you have to realize you don't have to be a jerk to stand your ground. So here are a few ways you can stand your ground. Number one, uh, and this kind of depends on the type of relationship that you have, uh, but number one, if you want to stand your ground and, and, and you know the person really well, you have a good relationship with them, you can be playful and you can use humor to stand your ground. Somebody that you love and care about and that you know pretty well um, does something that's pretty controlling, uh, you can say, sir, yes, sir, and kind of break the ice with a little humor like that. Uh, you might be able to get away with something like, can, is there anything else I can do for you, my queen? You might be, able, <laughs> might be able to get away with that once or twice. Tread lightly, but you might, <laughs> you might be able to get away with that. As long as a couple things exist in your relationship. Number one, as long as you're actually funny, that could work. (laughs) Because some of you think you're funny, but you're really not, and it comes across snarky and kind of jerky, right? And so you got to make sure if you're going to try that, that it really is received as humor, you know? And you have to make sure... Um, that is appropriately, appropriately used. Humor can shine light on truth, disarm difficult behavior, and show that you have composure in the moment, uh, but it can also drive a wedge. So you just got to be wise in how you use it, but you can use humor. A big thing about standing your ground that you have to learn, though, is you can't take this personal. You can't take their controlling issue personally. Because it's their issue, it's not really about you. Do you understand? The reality is you just happen to be the one in their crosshairs at that moment. They're the one that's got the issue, not you. And so you can stand firm there and not allow it to be all about you. One good way to do this is to learn the phrase, it must not be easy to tell yourself inside. So-and-so is always controlling. It must not be easy to work for somebody 40, 50 hours a week that's so demanding. So-and-so is always so aggressive. It must not be easy to have such a high-pressured role in a competitive environment. That must not be easy. So-and-so is so needy. 
it must not be easy to have grown up in a home with a bunch of Dodger fans. It just must not have been easy. You see how this makes it less personal about you and more about them and gives you an ability to have compassion and grace for them? So be confrontational when you stand up, if you must, if it's necessary, but for the Lord's sake and for yours, for your relational sake, always be gracious. There will come a time when you will need to stand your ground bluntly and boldly and confrontation is going to come your way. And you're going to have to go for it to stand your ground. It'll be the right thing to do in that moment. Please keep in mind the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. Watch out in the process that you don't trip over the plank that is sticking out of your eye. So be bold, be confident when you stand your ground, and always be gracious. Thomas Kempis, Imitation of Christ, writes it this way. Be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish you to be. Number three, reach out. In managing your relationships, there's going to be an appropriate time in some of those relationships where you reach out. With a heart of grace and empathy, you reach out in love to help somebody realize what they are doing. You care about this person, you know this person well, and so you need to have the strength in your personality, you need to have the strength in who you are to be able to reach out and to be able to not only confront or stand firm, but you need to reach out with grace and mercy to try to help them recognize what's going on in their lives and help them move forward. This week at our staff meeting, um, we all uh, got to review some results of an emotional test that our emotional Yoda, Carlisle, gave us a few weeks ago. We all took this EQ test, and we were going to get together as a staff and go over the results and Carlisle sat us all down and had all the results in his hand. And this is what he said to all of us seated around the table. He said, hey, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at, the, at our, our emotional things that, that, that we're not really that good at, uh, maybe our emotional failures, so to speak, or the things that we really need to, to grow in the most. And everybody swallowed hard and, and was saying inside their head, just smile, it'll be okay, this will work. And... and and he goes, and so here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to read for you, without the person's name, their three worst emotional traits right now. And you're going to guess which staff member it is. <laughs> I am not lying. This was his idea. This was his idea. And we all looked at each other and said, okay, this will be fun, right? And I don't know what was more awkward, knowing that everybody was going to hear my three worst emotional traits or that I was going to have to hear everyone else's traits and go, oh, that is totally so-and-so, right? And call them out with that. And so we did. We went through it, and it, it, it was difficult. It was challenging and wonderful all at the same time. It was challenging and wonderful. You know you will never really be free unless you know the truth. And your friends and your family members, those who have controlling issues, will never really be free until they recognize these tendencies in their lives. I need people, people like Carlisle and the staff, to tell me the truth so that I can grow. I also need to be open to helping others that are around me get set free by the truth. There are people in your life that need your candor, your perspective your help, and your compassionate love to help them grasp the significance of their controlling issues. While you are certainly not responsible by any means for their change, while you are not responsible for what they are doing, you can be useful to God and to them 
to help be a mirror of sorts to help them move forward. You can be used in God's hand to change their life. So earlier in the message, I asked after I read that long list of types of controllers if you could think of anybody, and chances are one of those individuals is close to you. Now I'm going to ask you to pray, and I'll close with this. Pray today and ask God if he is wanting to use you to reach out in grace and compassion with a helping hand to one of those friends that, that maybe God would say, yes, I would love to use you in their lives. May God, may God change the, the course of history for some of your friends, for you. May he begin to work in our hearts for us to see our issues and then work in our hearts to help us to move forward confidently to help others with theirs. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, thank you for Jesus and that he came and told us the truth, showed us a big old mirror, showed us our ugliness, and then God uh, gave us help and healing after he did so. And God, may we, be, may we be like that. May we be men and women who first look at ourselves and um, remove our planks, God. And then may we be useful and compassionate and generous with grace as we help others, as they work through their issues as well. And oh God, would you please set us free through this truth? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you um, walked in, you were handed that communication card. You've already probably filled out a good portion of that. Um, you can place that along with your offering as these ushers come forward right now to receive those. Thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, man, God is really using your generosity here to make a difference in the lives of people. Um, it's exciting from where we sit to see that. And uh, so thank you so much uh, for your generosity. Hey, I want to invite uh, Pastor Johnny to the stage. Could you welcome him to the stage, everybody, as he uh, comes up here? Um, I want to let you know that eight years ago this month, Johnny joined our team. Can you believe that? Eight years ago, he was leaving college, uh, just graduated, was looking for a job. Uh, we were desperate, and uh, so um, we offered Johnny an opportunity, and it's been a great thing for us. It's been a great thing for us. However, today, some sad news, uh, Johnny has sensed the call to move on. And uh, we wanted to get you guys all up to speed on what that looks like. Uh, so, Johnny, tell us, what's God doing in your life? Uh, what's next for you and Christina? Well, um, yeah. So, yeah, God has uh, called us to move on and move forward. Uh, and so short term, what we want to do is I want to finish uh, my schooling. I have 16 credit hours left in my master's program. And I really want to finish by December, so I just really want to focus on that. Uh, and then right after um, December's over, right after I'm done with school, uh, God has called us to plant a church here in the valley, uh, so we're going to begin the early stages of, of planting a church, um, and so we're going to really focus on that, and hopefully uh, January, by God's grace, uh, January 2020, there'll be a brand new church here um, in the valley, so that's what uh, kind of the future holds for us, for Christina and I, so, yeah. Well, man, I mean, I've said it uh... I've said it over the last few months as we knew this day was coming. You have been like a huge blessing uh, to us as a church, right? To us as a church. And uh, to, to many of our students, um, of course, uh, all my children have been through your ministry or are involved in your ministry now. I got uh, two of my kids that went all the way through and they're serving the Lord, doing ministry right now. And I, I, I um, uh, like to remind myself and um, remind you often that that has a, uh, uh, a big reason why that happened is because of you and, and your influence in their lives. And so I am super not only um, uh, sad because of what you leaving means to our church, but what it means to us. And, uh, and you've been, man, you've been a great guy on, to have on staff these last eight years. We've gone through a lot together and and um, we got some wounds we've licked together, and I, I've really, really appreciated you. Uh, so how can we pray for you as you make this transition? Because we're excited for you, man. Our little boy's growing up. You know, about time he gets out of the house now. I mean, yeah. Uh, no, he's, yeah. he's growing up, and we're excited to see that. We're big believers in church planning, as you know, and so we're, uh, 
we know that God's going to use you and do great things through you. So how can we be praying for you yeah, over this transition? Oh, thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the biggest thing is, would you just pray that God would guide my wife and I? There's so many unknowns right now, and we just need a lot of guidance. Um, and we pray that as God guides us, that we would be really sensitive uh, to his guidance and that we would listen and that we would follow no matter where he takes us. Uh, and what he calls us to do. Uh, and the second thing, short term, is um, I'm still going to need a job. <laughs> so uh, when we made this decision to follow God's calling, we kind of did it, and we didn't know what was going to happen, and I don't have a job lined up right now or anything like that. So um, I did um, print my resume, <laughs> if anybody is hiring. So um, I need a job. So, yeah, so God, just pray that God would guide us and then pray for uh, a job here as I leave Journey. So those are the two biggest things. And I really, really appreciate um, uh, your prayers. And most importantly, I appreciate you letting me serve you these past years. Yeah. Hey, so uh, here's what's next. Um, we've been uh, kind of putting our heads together and figuring out what's next. Johnny's last Sunday is going to be May 20th. Um, so it's the third Sunday in the month of May. And um, he is going to be preaching that day on legacy. And so um, I really encourage all of you to be here, even sit in the front row, you know, get here, get here early um, and support him on, on that day. And let's hear from him uh, one final time here in the service. Uh, and so we'll have a little bit of a celebration um, for him on that day. Uh, we'll work with the students directly and the volunteers in there to uh, try to plan um, a good exit for him and a celebration for him in the student um, area as well. We already got the staff stuff covered. We know um, what we're doing there. And so um, we're going to be celebrating him uh, in the month of May as he goes and moves on. He's been so faithful to us and so faithful to minister here. And so we'll be uh, celebrating him as he goes out. And then uh, we'll keep in touch. I mean, he's part of our family. And so we'll be keeping you guys up to date on what's going on. And, and we want nothing but the best for him uh, from here on out. On the student ministry side, uh, we have been in process. We've been looking for our next student ministry pastor. We anticipate God bringing um, a, a great individual again uh, to our team in, in his timing. And so you'll uh, be, if you have students in that world, you'll be paying attention as we We'll be uh, doing some candidating visits here very shortly and making a decision as God leads us and guides us down that road. Okay, so let's all stand up and pray for Johnny. Come on, let's do it. God, uh, thank you so much uh, for how uh, you have worked in our lives and our family's lives and, and God, how you have used Johnny powerfully. And thank you, God, for his integrity, for his desire to point people to you, for his love of uh, the gospel, the word of God and love of people. And God, I just pray that you'd help him to flourish, open up doors wide for him, God. Uh, help, um, help him to know that, that he's, he's exactly where you want him to be, God. And um, just encourage him and Christina down that road. And God, I pray you'd open up the door for us, bring us another great student pastor who's going to in, invest in the lives of the people that he cares about deeply. And God, would you uh, please do great things uh, in and through us as well, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Round of applause for this guy again, man. Take your resume and get out of here.